thank you, Lord, for, for you, for who you are. Lord, for your love, your grace, your mercy, your kindness. Lord, you're so good, and you're so good to us. We confess to you, Lord, that you treat us so much better than what we deserve. And Lord, we pray now that you would speak to us through your word. By the power of your Holy Spirit, that you would reach into our hearts and, and our minds. Lord, that you would cause us to hear from you this morning during this service. Lord, be glorified here now. Speak to us, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. The title of today's teaching is, Time's Up. <laughs> and, you know, I get to think it how we're all used to living against the clock these days, aren't we? I mean, I mean so much. You've got to get this done by five. or got to get this project finished by Friday. And you think about how many sports are governed by the clock, right? In fact, with football, you get a two-minute warning. Time's almost up. Get with it, guys, kind of thing. So you know, we're kind of used to that. And, and there's a, it seems like there's a, a clock running on almost everything. In fact, everything we buy now. You notice that? You, you got expiration date on there. And, and last Tuesday, I, just coincidentally, I was going through, we've got a little plastic box in the closet with all of our over-the-counter medicines, you know, and anything you might kind of need. I went through it thinking, okay, what do we actually have in here? I had a congestion thing and trying to find something for it. And I, you know what? I need to go through this thing, see what's expired. Some of those things in there, we throw out probably half a dozen bottles that were over two years expired. <laughs> I was like, okay. Uh, and even soft drinks have expiration dates now. You, you, have you seen that? They never did that when I was a kid. Okay, I think you drank it, you were fine kind of thing. And, and if you don't have like a, uh, an expiration date on something, you've got a best used by date. Have you seen that? It's like not quite as severe, right? You know, with an expiration date, if you don't use it by that date, the next day, poof, you drink it, you die. <laughs> you know, the best used by, it's like, well, it's just going to be a little funkier after that date kind of thing. And the, the, the thing is that everything that we, we kind of deal with these days seems to have some kind of, of connection to time. And that, that, that time and, and the fact that we're running out of time, we're, we're so conscious of that these days. And, and you know, even us, do you know, we have a, a, an expiration date. You know that? <laughs> yeah, check it out. It's on the bottom of your left foot. <laughs> no, put your shoes back on, Denny. Um, <laughs> but the, the thing is, there's this predetermined point in time that we're rapidly moving towards. Every day, we get a little closer to that expiration date. In Ecclesiastes 3, verse 2, we're told there's a time to be born and a time to die, a time to plant and a time to pluck what is planted. <laughs> Hebrews 9, 27 says, And as it is appointed for men to die once, but after this, the judgment. The older I get, though, I think we not only have an expiration date, but I think we have a best used by date on us somewhere. Because I know, I know around about 1990, 1995, somewhere around there, you know, that was my best used by date. Because like we saw Wednesday, how the Bible calls these bodies a tent, a temporary dwelling place. Man, my, my tent has been wearing out, seems like, reminding me every day. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I was telling the younger guys that were here Wednesday night, yeah, you don't know anything about this. Wait 30 years. Yeah. <laughs> and then you start realizing, oh, man, you know, the, the, everything starts wearing out. The tin starts falling apart. And, and you're just reminded, you know what? We're getting closer to that expiration date. And today we're going to see the clock run out for several people here in chapter 9. Now, Jehoram, who's also uh, known as Joram, uh, he's the son of Israel's most wicked king, a guy named Ahab. And Jehoram, or Joram, is now reigning in Israel. He's the king of Israel now, the ten northern tribes. Ahaziah, who was also a wicked guy, he was the grandson of Jehoshaphat, who was a good king, is now reigning in Judah. 
And that's where we pick it up here. Let's start in verses 1 through 3. And Elisha, the prophet, called one of the sons of the prophets and said to him, Get yourself ready. Take this flask of oil in your hand and go to Ramoth Gilead. Now, when you arrive at the place, look there for Jehu, or Yehu, the son of Jehoshaphat, the son of Nimshi. And go in and make him rise up from among his associates and take him to an inner room. Then take the flask of oil and pour it on his head and say, Thus says the Lord, I have anointed you king over Israel. Then open the door and flee and do not delay. Yehu's father, Jehoshaphat, by the way, was not the same Jehoshaphat that had been king of Judah. This is a different guy with the same name. And the whole deal about the anointing oil, where Elisha has this this young prophet go and anoint him, pour oil on him. They did that with the kings and the priests. It was really an outward sign of the Holy Spirit coming upon them to, to give them the ability to fulfill their calling. So look at verses 4 through 10. So the young man, the servant of the prophet, went to Ramoth Gilead. And when he arrived there, there were captains of of the army sitting. And he said, I have a message for you, commander. Yehu said, for which one of us? And he said, for you, commander. Then he arose and went into the house. And he poured the oil on his head and said to him, thus says the Lord God of Israel. I have anointed you king over the people of the Lord, over Israel. You shall strike down the house of Ahab, your master, that I may avenge the blood of my servants, the prophets, <coughs> excuse me, and the blood of all the servants of the Lord at the hand of Jezebel. For the whole house of Ahab shall perish. And I will cut off from Ahab all the males in Israel, both bond and free. So I will make the house of Ahab like the house of Jeroboam, the son of Nebat, and like the house of Baasha, the son of Ahijah. The dog shall eat Jezebel and the plot of ground on the plot of ground at Jezreel, and there shall be none to bury her. And he opened the door and fled. So just kind of bringing us back to that, that point when, when we were in 1 Kings, uh, there was so much evil, so many murders. You know, Jezebel had all of the, the, the uh, prophets of the Lord murdered other than the hundred that were, were hidden away by a guy named Obadiah. They, there were two caves, remember, but she murdered all the rest of them. And she committed a lot of, of murders and wickedness, and so did Ahab. We were told he was the worst king, the most evil king that Israel ever had. And in chapter uh, 21 of 1 Kings, you get kind of the, the last straw there. And it's referred here. But it's when Ahab's wife, Jezebel, had Naboth killed so Ahab could get Naboth's vineyard in Jezreel. And God had Elijah go to Ahab in 1 Kings 21, 21. And he said, behold, I will bring calamity on you. I will take away your posterity and will cut off from Ahab every male in Israel, both bond and free. Then in verses 23 and 24, it says, and concerning Jezebel, the Lord also spoke saying, the dog shall eat Jezebel by the wall of Jezreel. The dog shall eat whoever belongs to Ahab and dies in the city. And the birds of the air shall eat whoever dies in the field. Now, it was a pretty ominous word that God had Elijah say to King Ahab. And it had an impact, remember? He repented. In 1 Kings 21, verses 27 through 29, we read, And so it was when Ahab heard those words that he tore his clothes and put sackcloth on his body and fasted and lay in sackcloth and went about mourning. And the word of the Lord came to Elijah the Tishbite saying, See how Ahab has humbled himself before me? Because he has humbled himself before me, I will not bring the calamity in his days. In the days of his son, I will bring the calamity on his house. God is just and Sin must be punished. God responded, though, to Ahab's repentance by giving him more time. That's what he did. And the time, though, 
for Jezebel and the rest of Ahab's family, which were all wicked. The time was now up. And to Jezebel, and it is, I think this is so important that we realize this, to Jezebel and the rest of Ahab's family, uh, they, they no doubt knew about this prophecy that Elijah had given to Ahab. Because you think about it, we just read, you know, he, he tore his clothes, he put on sackcloth, put on ashes, he fasted, he mourned. That could not have, have went on unseen by his wife, Jezebel, by his sons. And, and so they all knew about it. But folks, understand, it probably seemed to them like it was not going to happen. They, they may have forgotten all about it. It's been t- actually 12 years and nothing has happened since Elijah gave that prophecy to Ahab. But all the while, the clock's been ticking, moving forward, moving forward to this time. And, and during that time, God had been working, raising up Yehu to a place of prominence, to, to a place of, of a respected leader within the army of Israel. So, so Yehu has heard the word of the Lord here. From this young prophet. He's been anointed to be the next king of Israel. And he's to carry out God's edict on the house of Ahab. And the uh, apprentice prophet, he obeys. He leaves right away. And Yehu goes back to his buddies, the captains uh, of the army. Look at verse 11. Then Yehu came out to the servants of his master. And one said to him, is all well? Why did this madman come to you? And he said to them, you know the man in his babble. I like the way the NIV words it. When Yehu went out to his fellow officers, one of them asked him, is everything all right? Why did this maniac come to you? (laughs) Uh, You know the man and the sort of things he says, Yehu replied. So Yehu just tries to kind of blow this whole thing off. He doesn't want to make a big deal. Oh, yeah, you know, you know how these guys are. And, and verse 12, and they said, a lie. Tell us now. So he said, thus and thus he spoke to me, saying, thus says the Lord, I have anointed you king over Israel. See, he tried to just kind of underplay what had just happened. And when you think about it, put yourself in his place. And I always think we understand what, God says and does in the Bible when we kind of try and put ourselves in the places of the people that we're reading about there. I mean, he's, he's there with his contemporaries. He's well-respected, he's, and we'll see that he's aware of the Word of God. He's, he's someone who is not a wicked guy, but, you know, he comes out. And how do you tell your buddies, hey, I'm the king? You know, how do you do that? Yeah, he's he, apparently a humble guy, too, you know, so... The, the captains, his buddies there, they, they knew it was more than just Babel. The prophet was no doubt serious when he approached Yehu and all of them sitting there. I mean, you think about that. How would you be if you were a young prophet and you had been given this important message by God? You're on a mission from God. And, and then you go there. It's like, I got to tell him this. I got to get him away from his friends, go in the house, tell him this. And then I got to get out of Dodge, man. I got to get out of here kind of thing. And so... No doubt his buddies saw this, and I'll bet that Yehu's countenance was a lot different coming out of the house than when he went in, right? I mean, wouldn't you be? I'm the next king. (laughs) Oh, man. (laughs) You know, you got all things racing around in your head. What if they don't like me? What if they don't want me to be king? Well, how do I do that? I've never been a king. I never even thought about being a king. What do I do now? And no doubt, he's, you know, just kind of half freaking out there. It's like, what's going on? His buddy's like, a lie. Tell us now. In fact, I like the way the New Living Translation words their response. You're hiding something, (laughs) they said. Tell us. So he did. He told them there, and look how they responded in verse 13. Then each man hastened to take his garment and put it under him on top of the steps, and they blew trumpets, saying, Yehu is king. Yehu is king. Yahoo for Yehu. <laughs> it's interesting here. They're all on board. See that? Nobody, you don't see any dissension there. It must have been something about Yehu that they saw that caused them not to be surprised that God 
uh, would make him the next king. And even though Israel was full of wickedness at that time, there were still some who trusted in Yahweh and, and believed his word. Just like it was, when remember, when we were looking at the life of Elijah, how he got that old pity part, I'm the only one, I'm it, I'm the only one left that believes in you. And God said, no, 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 no. I've reserved 7,000 who have not bowed the knee to Baal. And Yehu was one of those guys. He wasn't an idolater. And so we'll see later on that Yehu knew what Ahab, Jezebel, and their whole family uh, were doing was evil. He knew that, and he did not approve of it. And then, we're not going to read it, but in verses 14 through 16, it tells us that Yehu came up with a plan how he would kill Joram. And even though Joram had been with them there at the battle there in Ramoth Gilead, they were fighting against the Syrians, he had been wounded at battle, and so they took him back home to Jezreel to recover. We're also told there that Ahaziah, king of Judah, who was buddies with Joram there, he had heard that the king was wounded, and so uh, he went to Jezreel to visit Joram. And then uh, Yehu, he takes off in his chariot with a bunch of soldiers. And that's where we pick it up in verse 17. Let's read through verse 19. Now a watchman stood on the tower in Jezreel, and he saw the company of Yehu as he came and said, I see a company of men. And Joram said, Get a horseman and send him to meet him, them. And let him say, Is it peace? So the horseman went to meet him and said, Thus says the king, Is it peace? And Yehu said, What have you to do with peace? Turn around and follow me. So the watchman reported, saying, The messenger went to them, but is not coming back. Then he sent out a second horseman who came to them and said, Thus says the king, Is it peace? And Yehu answered, What have you to do with peace? Turn around and follow me. They're going to run out of horsemen pretty soon. But apparently, after the second guy, they picked up the pace. Look at verse 20. So the watchman reported, saying, He went up to them and is not coming back. And the driving is like the driving of Yehu, the son of Nimshi, for he drives furiously. Again, the NIV where it's a little better. The driving is like that of Yehu, son of Nimshi. He drives like a maniac. <laughs> the guy had a reputation for the way he drove his chariot. And at this point, Joram, he knows something's up. And maybe it's news from the war. They don't know. And so verse 21, then Joram said, make ready. And his chariot was made ready. Then Joram, king of Israel, and Ahaziah, king of Judah, went out, each in his chariot. And he went out to meet Yehu and met him on the property of Naboth, the Jezreelite. And don't miss that. Don't miss where they're at, where they met. Just so happened to be at the plot of ground that Jezebel killed Naboth for. Don't miss that. That's no coincidence. Verse 22. Now it happened when Joram saw Yehu that he said, Is it peace, Yehu? So he answered, What peace as long as the harlotries of your mother Jezebel and her witchcraft are so many? I guess it's not peace. Verse 23 through 26. Then Joram turned around and fled and said to Ahaziah, Treachery, Ahaziah! Now Yehu drew his bow with full strength and shot Jehoram between his arms, and the arrow came out at his heart, and he sank down in his chariot. Then Yehu said to Bidkar, his captain, Pick him up and throw him into the tract of the field of Naboth the Jezreelite. For remember, when you and I were riding together behind Ahab his father, that the Lord laid this burden upon him. Surely I saw yesterday the blood of Naboth and the blood of his sons, says the Lord. And I will repay you in this plot, says the Lord. Now therefore, take and throw him on the plot of ground according to the word of the Lord. So apparently, Je Yehu and his captain Bidkar, they were with King Ahab uh, when Elijah gave Ahab that prophecy. And Yehu reminds Bidkar, hey man, this is happening just like God said. 
And so we're going to do what God said to do about this. And Yehu also gives us some information here that wasn't revealed before in 1 Kings. Verse 26, did you see that? The blood of Naboth and the blood of his sons. Jezebel not only killed Naboth, but all of his sons as well. Apparently anyone who might be an heir to his property. And then we're not going to read it, but verses 27 to 29, uh, Ahaziah, he tried to escape, but he was killed too. And that was God's will. Remember, he only reigned one year in Judah because he was so evil. And in 2 Chronicles, uh, chapter 22, verse 7, we're told this. His going to Joram was God's occasion for Ahaziah's downfall. For when he arrived, he went out with Jehoram against Yehu, the son of Nimshi, whom the Lord had anointed to cut off the house of Ahab. So that was all by God's design. I'm going to kill two bad guys at one time. But Yehu's not not through doing what the Lord has told him to do. Look at 30 and 31. Now when Yehu had come to Jezreel, Jezebel heard of it, and she put paint on her eyes and adorned her head and looked through a window. Then as Yehu entered the gate, she said, Is it peace, Zimri, murderer of your master? So apparently, old Jezzy, she knows her time is up. And she got all gussied up, did her hair, and put on makeup. I guess she wanted to look good in her coffin. (laughs) And by the way, she's being very sarcastic when she calls Yehu Zimri. Because remember, Zimri was the guy that God used to kill Elah, uh, Baasha's son, and all of Baasha's family for all of their wickedness. So Yehu, uh, really, he's, he's... on the same kind of mission, and Jezzy knew it. Her time was up. And you look at what she does, though, and I think this is another one of those things that God does not want us to miss. Look what she does when she realizes time's up. This is it. Instead of repenting, instead of getting ready to go into eternity and stand before God, the real God, She just puts on makeup, fixes her hair. So foolish. But you know what? A lot of people do that same thing. I've heard of so many people, okay, you know, they got cancer, they got this, that. They know they're dying. And they just kind of dress things up a little bit. You know, they'll, they'll... maybe take care of all their personal affairs and sell this and sell that and get get everything in order or whatever. Uh, But they don't don't surrender to the Lord. They don't take care of their eternity. They'll get everything looking good on the outside, but they don't do anything about standing before God. Foolish. Verse 32, And he looked up at the window and said, Who is on my side? Who? Who? So two or three of the eunuchs looked out at him. <laughs> they don't say anything. They just look out the window, stick their heads out the window, look at him. I know, you know. You know, hey, we're with you, you know. Thumbs up kind of thing. Verse 33, then he said, throw her down. So they threw her down, and some of her blood spattered on the wall and on the horses, and he trampled her underfoot. Pretty gruesome stuff, huh? If you're really going to make it honest, a movie <laughs> and go go really tight according to what uh, the scripture says. It would have to be an R-rated movie. And, and this, this is pretty gruesome stuff. You know, not only does she get thrown down from several stories up. I mean, she's high enough to where when she hits the ground, you know, blood splatters. But then that's not enough. You know, Jehu or Yehu, you know, He takes it and runs over her with his chariot and horses several times and tramples her. Her time was definitely up. But the rest of the prophecy against her wasn't completed yet. There's more, remember? Look at 34. And when he had gone in, he ate and drank. Then he said, go now, see to this accursed woman and bury her, for she was a king's daughter. Remember, she was the daughter of Uthbaal, uh, king of the Sidonians. And Yehu's thinking, well, you know, that should at least rate a burial for her. Go ahead and, you know, bury her. Well, look at 35 to 37. So they went to bury her, 
But they found no more of her than the skull and the feet and the palms of her hands. Therefore, they came back and told him. And he said, this is the word of the Lord, which he spoke by his servant Elijah the Tishbite, saying, On the plot of ground at Jezreel, dogs shall eat the flesh of Jezebel, and the corpse of Jezebel shall be as refuse on the surface of the field in the plot at Jezreel, so that they shall not say, here lies Jezebel. Folks, just like God said. (laughs) There's no graveside. You can't go over there and say, oh, look, here, here lies Jezebel. Nope, just like God said. And folks, understand this too. This is another main point. God wants us to understand. God's word never fails. What God has said, God will do. 100% accurate. You can can trust him. His word has never failed, will never fail. It all happened exactly the way that God said it would at the appointed time determined by God. See, God waited 12 years to fulfill this prophecy. Prophecy. And it may have seemed that God was being slack. He wasn't, he wasn't fulfilling this prophecy. You know, he, 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 wasn't, he wasn't doing what he promised to do in judging Ahab's house for their wickedness. But understand, it was 12 years that he gave them to repent, that they could turn from their sin. And that's something we need to remember when it comes to thinking about the end times, the rapture and the second coming of Christ and all that. There's all those people that say, oh, it ain't going to happen. In fact, the Bible even says towards the end times that there are going to be scoffers that will say, everything's going on just as it has been from the beginning. He ain't coming back. Well, 2 Peter 3.9 tells us, The Lord is not slack concerning his promise, as some count slackness, but is long-suffering toward us, not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. That's why God's waiting is so that each and every one of us would have that opportunity to get smart, to wise up and repent and to turn to him. And like I said before, the clock is running. We're all coming to that point when we hear, time's up. The time to get ready, though, is now. Not putting it off. In 2 Corinthians 6, 2, we're told, For he says, in an acceptable time I have heard you, And in the day of salvation, I have helped you. Behold, now is the accepted time. Behold, now is the day of salvation. It's today, folks. None of us are guaranteed one more hour on this planet. But, folks, we do have right now. That's what we do have. Today is the day to get ready for eternity, to receive salvation through Jesus Christ if you never have. Today is the day right now is the time to get right with the Lord. If you have walked with the Lord, if you are born again, but you've been messing around, you, you've been walking at a distance. Folks, if you're not ready to stand before him, now's the time. Don't do what, what Jezebel did. Just try and look good. Put some makeup on. You know, do your hair. Don't do that. Surrender to Christ completely. Receive by faith his death as payment for your sins. And when you do that, you'll be ready. And when you hear, time's up, you you can face that time with a smile and know that God is going to be pleased and and he'll welcome you in and you'll be spending in in eternity with him in a glorious place. Let's pray. Father, thank you. Thank you for your word. Thank you for what you have have kept there for us that we can know. Lord, not only that we can know you, but we can know what you require. We can know, Lord, how you operate. We can know what we need to do to be right with you. Lord, how awesome that all we have to do is put our faith in you. We don't have to scale mountains or swim the ocean or whatever. Lord, we just have to trust you. And Father, I pray for each and every person here today and those watching on the internet. Father, that you have spoken to them. I I pray, Lord, that they would surrender now. Lord, as we prepare our hearts for communion. Lord, that you would 
you would cause each and every one of us here to end anything in our lives, to commit right now in their hearts before you to end anything that is displeasing to you, to put their trust completely in you for now and eternity. And Lord, that we would be ready not just to take communion, but we would be ready when our time is up. Father, it's in Jesus' name that we pray. Amen. We're going to have the guys come forward and we're going to pass the elements out and, and just hang on to them until everybody is served and we'll all partake together.